Ho, it's July 13, 2021. I'm continuing with my really special guest. I think he's the best trial lawyer in America. He's done it. He's done it all, and he's right here, and he's still doing it. We're going to talk about the innocent one, but before that, I want to take him back to something he did uh, when he brought down 50 crooked cops. He did it on his own. Uh, no one's ever done that before or after. All right, let's talk about that. That when you found that rampant corruption, those cops. Uh, when I returned from uh, my uh, stint in Indiana and uh, started as defense lawyer practice, I found that the cops were. Uh, this was before Knapp Commission. The cops would say, for a certain amount of money, I could. Uh, change my testimony. And uh, I thought that nobody was calling them to task. And I decided to get a uh, briefcase with a sound equipment inside the briefcase. And I went to court one day, and two of the most dangerous cops in the uh, city, known for violence, uh, grabbed me and asked me whether I was wearing a wire. That would be a uh, uh, recording device on my person in the back. And they wanted me to step into the bathroom and stand in front of the uh, uh, sink, uh, which was uh, uh, easily uh, capable of breaking my teeth had I been smashed into the uh, porcelain. and. Uh, uh, they searched me to see if I had any equipment while one of them held me. And uh, at my foot was the briefcase that was recording all that had taken place. I realized that at this moment, uh, while I was really serving the ends of justice, my life was, in stake, uh, was at stake, but I did it because of a heightened sense of what was right and what was wrong. And I did that with some 50 cops, and uh, uh, they were uh, arrested. Uh, this narcotics squad was uh, uh, disbanded and uh, went on my way, uh, but not without a threat from the uh, lieutenant in charge of the narcotics squad that the only person hurt by this uh, act or these acts would be myself. That's, uh, I never heard of them, anyone doing that before or after. Uh, that could be a book in and of itself, what that experience. Um, but in the 70s, was that the time that uh, the book came out called The Prince of the City? Yes. Those guys were Yes, very yes, yes. Uh, that's true. But nobody had decided to tape record them surreptitiously. And. Uh, uh, in uh, the book that you're referring to, uh, someone had testified uh, for the prosecution, but nobody had uh, taken on to himself the responsibility of tape recording uh, the wrongdoing of the cops. I came here, Joe, because I wanted to speak about a topic that has uh, troubled me, and that is the innocent one. That's the story of a person caught up in the throes of the broken criminal justice system, where even the innocent could be found guilty and be prosecuted by a uh, malevolent prosecutor who descends to foul blows if necessary to win a conviction or even make an arrest. And I want you to know that by the latest count from the Innocent Project, uh, there are some 250,000 people who are innocent, who sit in prison as I speak with little or no help, 
uh, think about it, seated in cells eight by 12 with little or no hope, some doing 20, 30 years, even though they're innocent. Wikipedia puts the number at 120,000. And I think that is the scandal of police uh, misconduct. The innocent people who sit in prison. Now, segregation still exists. Uh, 20 miles east, for example, of Atlanta, or 25 miles east of Natchez, uh, you'll find uh, segregated communities. Ruth Ginsburg said that you can tell whether a community is segregated by the residents. Uh, and the residents, for example, even of New York, with uh, blacks living in uh, a, an area in Harlem, you don't find them generally living in uh, uh, the 50s and 60s on the east side. They suffer from police uh, misconduct. Jay, and the, Jay hold yeah. on for one second. Talking about blacks, these innocent people, these hundreds of thousands that are sitting in jails, what are they? Well, they're not all blacks. There are many whites. Uh, in fact, the Netflix has uh, uh, the making of a murderer, Stephen Avery, uh, which is uh, uh, highly recommended by me. It shows our prosecutor zeroes in on a particular person because in private practice, he's had a run-in with the uh, person, but now he's a prosecutor. And he resorts to all techniques to uh, uh, imprison uh, an innocent person. And if I may, I'd like to give you the six uh, most common causes of wrongful convictions. May I? The first is uh, misidentification. Crimes take place sometimes, if not often, in the dark with little lighting. And uh, misidentification by far is the chief reason for a wrongful conviction. Second is incorrect forensics. Uh, Judge Rakoff in a book tells of a Madrid bombing and uh, uh, the fingerprints were sent all over Europe, Interpol, to see if there was a match. And there was no match, but the FBI came up with a match. Brandon Mayfield, he was tending his garden in Oregon and he was arrested by six FBI agents. As he sat in jail, the FBI admitted that it was mistaken. The person who read the fingerprints was an error. So this was the case of a penalty of forensic misconduct. There's much to be said of the fact that bite testimony, uh, blood spatter testimony, is something that has to be explored in a 350-page report to Congress, a study group demonstrated that uh, forensic proof is often misguided, and I recommend that to all trial lawyers. False confessions. People are detained, deprived of food or drink. They're lied to. If you don't confess, you're going to get this sentence or that sentence. Food is not provided, and the detained purpose, uh, person person's will is overborne, and they testify. They the, confess, uh, they actually confess. They, they uh, falsely confess, you're quite right. The other reason is use of informants. People who hope to get an advantage, a reduced sentence, uh, some benefit from the government by uh, testifying. It could be a snitch who's outside as a co-defendant who testifies, or it could be somebody in jail who suddenly says, I didn't question the person. The person confided in me, and I was just a uh, listening post. The uh, use of an informant or a snitch is a major factor. And the last major factor is an inadequate defense. Most of these defendants don't have the money for a lawyer so a court appoints someone, often 
a person who has a heavy caseload, someone who has little experience in trying, for example, a murder case, and the result is that they uh, suffer. They, they get convicted. And they're convicted. <laughs> and there's nobody out there. I think, I think there might be one more. Maybe I missed it. Misconduct by detectives and prosecutors. You, yes. You, you went through that one? Yes, official right. misconduct. There is an epidemic, says a judge in California, of violations of Brady. And I've made a special study of the Brady obligation. That's the obligation of a prosecutor to turn over information that's helpful to the defense. Prosecutors hide that evidence. They conceal it. And uh, it isn't until some time post-trial, it could be 20 years after a person has lost his youth, has lost the liberty that he should have, that it's discovered. And this results in a uh, horrible, wrongful conviction. Wrongful conviction. Yeah. And uh, the uh, person who suffers the most is the, uh, not always, is a black defendant and in the Deep South. Although illegal exonerations take place in Illinois, Kentucky, and New York is the third most uh, prolific area of wrongful convictions. A wrongful conviction is not something that uh, is comparable or consistent with the rule of law. It's part of the broken system uh, in the uh, uh, criminal justice system. So when people argue for the rule of law, that we comport with the rule of law, you can't comport with the rule of law when there are 700,000 people sitting in a jail sentence who may be innocent. Um. I've come across <laughs> um, that examples of the broken law so many times where they've held back information that was exculpatory. It's just amazing. And uh, the prosecutors that do this, when it's discovered, nothing happens to them. They, they, it's have, true. they have absolute immunity. And if you, bring, <clears throat> if you bring a complaint, a grievance complaint against them, it gets thrown out. There is... Uh uh, only two cases among the thousands of cases of wrongdoing that come to mind. One is in Arizona, where the prosecutor was disbarred. But the other one that made the headlines, uh, I'm sure your visiting or viewing audience may remember, is five lacrosse players from Duke were prosecuted based on testimony of there being a rape of two women. The women recanted and were firm in their recantation. The prosecutor worked hard to get them to uh, in incriminate the five lacrosse players. It turned out that a uh, special prosecutor appointed by the governor to look into the situation determined that the prosecutor had made promises of gratuities and other emoluments to these two blood, to these two persons who uh, uh, made the charges against the uh, lacrosse players. And the prosecutor was uh, disbarred and eventually sentenced to prison. Um, something came to mind. This thing about forensic evidence. I had a case years ago out here, which was the longest trial out here, and the only evidence against my client was DNA evidence. And by going through that case, I, I realized for the first time that you could frame a person with DNA evidence. It's very easy to do. Well, I, I write in my uh, upcoming podcast uh, entitled The Innocent One, that uh, any kind of evidence in the hands of a malevolent prosecutor can make your life hardly worth living. Okay. And uh, immunity, immunity 
of a prosecutor is such that it uh, begets wrongful conduct. And this is where the American system breaks down. It's a uh, uh, effort to win a conviction at all costs, despite what the uh, proof may honestly uh, demonstrate. Prosecutors are people. Justice Sutherland, in a case against Berger against the United States, made a statement that a prosecutor is a minister of justice. He's here to see that justice is done. He doesn't deal in foul blows. Judges often cited Berger against the United States as representing the true state of affairs of the rule of law. But that's nonsense. To a prosecutor, winning is everything. And if concealing evidence is necessary, they will conceal evidence. They get themselves convinced that the person they are proceeding against is a person to be pursued. And I must tell you, a new book came out by John Kroger called Conviction. Mm. And he recites that far from being a minister of justice, people are threatened. Their spouses are threatened. They are threatened with lengthy jail sentences unless they, quote, come clean. And the weak can't stand, can't stand up to the threat. And they uh, bow to the will of the prosecutor. That is the broken system of justice that we face. And that's monumentally important. And the question is, how is that corrected? I remember on law day, they had five appellate division judges uh, write uh, how wonderful the American system of criminal justice is. But it can't be so great with several hundred thousand innocent people sitting in jail cells. And we're lucky to have Barry Sheck and his uh, cohorts, uh, Philip Kleinfeld, to uh, form the Innocent Project because they've re uh, released or caused to be released hundreds of people who are falsely accused. And it's sad to think that a person is sitting in a cell for 25 years knowing that they did not commit the crime for which they are sentenced and doing time. Um, I, I've, I've come across some really despicable prosecutors, but in most cases, the judges don't do anything about it. You're quite right, Joe. A judge is a passive person. He's guilty of lassitude, is the expression. He seldom takes a role antithetical to the uh, prosecutor. He goes along with the prosecutor. He's just a, another prosecutor, as opposed to, per, to a person who takes a position that the person is truly entitled to the presumption of innocence. He's a uh, cause of the uh, uh, broken criminal They justice. facilitate. The but I've got to tell you this. With respect to the crime ra ra rage, uh, judges uh, are bound by the reform, bail reform law, and their hands are tied. And the guilty people, because of the pressure of certain groups, the governor signs a bill that hamstrings a judge and limits the judge's discretion in terms of uh, uh, setting bail for possible wrongdoers. So judges have a very difficult role. They set bail, and then when the trial starts, they're not searching in their inquiry. They go along with the prosecutor. I've often said that they're just another person at the prosecution's table, and that's a sad commentary on our rule of law. Another juror that's going to vote to convict, <laughs> basically. Well, uh, it's seldom to find a judge. And we lost one, Judge Weinstein, oh. who stands as a paragon, in my mind, of virtue. Um, 
I didn't realize that, I just found out that uh, he was a World War II vet. Yeah, and, um, yeah, that's true. Was he in the Air Force, I think? But I know I, I knew Judge Weinstein. I actually tried a case in front of yes. him. He was really good. Well, you tried uh, cases in the Eastern District uh, with distinction. And people knew of you and respected you for the work that you did. And I'm happy that you found a way uh, to broadcast uh, not only your skill, uh, but the skill of others who you choose to invite. But one of the things I experienced in the Eastern District, uh, because that's most, most of my federal cases were there, some in the Southern District, that the prosecutors, like you say, would do anything to win, and they can get away with it. So they can come into court and suborn perjury. They could frame people, and they, I saw them do it, and you couldn't stop them. Well, the reason, Joe, is winning is everything. Contrary to Justice Sutherland, a member of the Supreme Court in the 30s. But they, I mean, they go to the extent, it's like they just out and out put people on the stand that lie. Yes. It's suborn perjury, and nobody does anything about it. And, it, and, and I had one time, one time in, in front of Judge Glasser, I was doing a hearing I thought Judge Glasser was a good judge, but he's, he's got some bad things too. But we were doing a hearing, and this narcotic cop was on, on the stand, and uh, he testified, and then I started to cross-examine him, and the judge looked over at him and said, do you realize you're under oath to, to the witness? Mm -hmm. And he told the U.S. attorney, get him off the stand. Well, that's unique. Well, he Judge says, Glasser would do that. He, he was did it. Man, he was a man of courage. Yeah, <laughs> Weinstein and Glasser were two, and Nickerson were three people in the Eastern District that were unmatched yeah. by judges in the Southern District. Uh, although I wrote a law review article on Judge Nathan from the Southern District, she's a, a rather recent pointy. Nathan. Oh, I know her. I've, I've read about her recently. And she demanded certain uh, rules imposed by her to deal with Brady violations. No longer is it sufficient for a prosecutor to get up and say, I'm aware of my obligations. They're not aware of their obligations. Since their quest is to win, they hold back proof. And she requires a set schedule. Uh, Congress has said, as of October of uh, last year, that uh, judges have to set schedules for the turnover of helpful information to a defense. And judges have responded with rules requiring the turnover of Brady material, the withholding of information that could be of use to a defense lawyer is shocking, but they do that. Absolutely. And judges don't monitor it. How do you, is, is there a way to, for a judge to determine whether or not the prosecution has Brady material? Yes. Because it's not, right now, the, usually the prosecutor determines what is Brady material. Well, uh, in uh, October, in response to Judge Nathan's uh, uh, rules uh, and her observations about uh, a case of great consequence, the uh, uh, Michael Flynn, uh, the first head of uh, security for National Security Advisor for the President, where the government withheld key evidence, she laid down a rule that requires prosecutors to obey 20 different conditions and make disclosure to the judge. And then Congress passed an amendment to the uh, criminal uh, procedure law in which they said that each judge should make rules 
to ensure the proper divulging of evidence helpful to a defendant. And so judges have now made rules helpful to a defendant by requiring a uh, disclosure, by having hearings to discover whether the uh, prosecutor has honored his Brady obligation. And this will go a long way in helping a defendant prepare for trial on an even keel with the prosecutor. Does that law apply to state? state? No, the state, the state the state has always been more alert to the possibility of a wrongful withholding of evidence. And in a case uh, that was early decided by the New York Court of Appeals, the legislature passed a rule that says within two months, certain kinds of evidence must be disclosed. The state is ahead and has been ahead of the federal government with respect to Brady material. Uh, I've, had, I've had some really bad experiences where they've held out uh, information that absolutely showed my client was guilty. They already had been indicted for murder. State. Yes. Um, all right, we're coming to an end again. Uh, I am committed to do this. Uh, talk about this as long as you want. It's really important. Uh, people out there never hear this. Well, I deal with this in the book, The Courtroom is My Theater. And I deal with this in my book, Politics Over Honor. And may I have them? I, uh, this is the latest. It's the story of RFK and JFK's default in combating crime when politics intervened. It shows how uh, politics can ruin the uh, obligation of a president and an attorney general to see that the law is...